Man, I was so skeptical about putting out this review. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but a few weeks ago, Derbauer reported on some X299 BRM overheating issues that he was having with a multitude of different boards, labeling it the X299 VRM disaster. The VRMs were getting so toasty that they were thermal throttling the performance of his Skylake X chip. But then OC3D with Tiny Tom Logan came out with a review on his Asus ROG Strix board and said that he wasn't observing any thermal restrictions with his VRMs and that everything was fine. I was a bit confused because I trust the research and testing that your Bauer puts into his videos, but then OC3D was validating the results I was personally seeing with slightly high VRM temps, but nothing that could be constituted as being near a throttling limit. But then those gents collaborated and put out update videos on exactly how they reached the numbers that made the VRMs throttle, which helped me understand exactly why I wasn't experiencing any thermal limitations. So let's walk through that bit first before we get into the general review of this ROG Strix motherboard. I'm going to link their videos in the description below so you can check them out if you want more of a deep dive into this subject. But from everything I can see, VRM throttling shouldn't be an issue for the majority of general consumers out there even if you're overclocking. I actually experienced no throttling on this motherboard and I'll explain why that's the case. Firstly, most Skylake X processors are going to reach their thermal limit well before you start taxing the VRM's thermal limits. As I mentioned in my 7820X review, the highest frequency I could reach on the chip due to cooling constraints was 4.5 GHz, which only resulted in roughly a 200 watt power draw from the chip, which didn't lead to anything above 65 degrees C or so on the VRM's, either from the monitoring probe that Asus puts on the motherboard or from the additional monitoring probes that I used to verify my testing. Is that hot? Definitely, but nowhere near enough to start dropping the frequency on the CPU. The core temp was the massively limiting aspect here. However, if you delid your Skylake X CPU, your core temp will likely stop being the relevant limit factor, and then the VRMs might take over. But again, not a normal user scenario. Secondly, as discovered by the previously mentioned channels, there's a lot of factors that actually went into making the throttling temperatures happen. You have to not only overclock the core on the chip, but then also increase the current capability of the CPU, and apparently this only occurs when you're running Prime95 and you get those sort of temperatures, which most people just won't end up doing even if they're overclocking. Will this happen for some of you? Sure. And does that mean the cooling on these VRMs is inadequate? It absolutely does. I'm not here saying that the issue that was discovered doesn't exist, just that it's not going to be an issue for most, including myself. Setting the CPU to 4.5 GHz, just adjusting the core voltage, let me play games and edit my videos all day with no semblance of either temperature or throttling on the VRMs, or even any sort of clock drop for any other sort of throttling. The key issue comes in if you're actually properly trying to push your system and CPU to the limits and focusing more on absolutely max performance than everyday performance. Delitting your CPU, raising current limits on your processor, running Prime95, those aren't average circumstances. The average circumstances, the ones I tested this system under, kept everything cool and steady with a decent 4.5 overclock. Should Asus and other vendors fix these VRM cooling solutions? Definitely. Not excusing the issue that's going on here. However, I'm also saying that if you use this motherboard for what it's labeled for, that is, gaming, then you'll likely not encounter any of the VRM issues at all. And if you actually are looking for a decent overclocking board, keep in mind that ASUS hasn't released the Rampage line yet, which is more suited for these types of hard-hitting overclocking setups, and hopefully by then ASUS will have their VRM cooling figured out. Again, keep in mind that this issue isn't strictly limited to ASUS. It appears to be affecting nearly all vendors' motherboards at the moment. And once more, if you want the in-depth lowdown on these issues, be sure to check out Derbauer's and OC3D's videos on this subject. And big thanks to them for going so detailed with the testing methodology. It certainly helped me figure out why my numbers were matching Tiny Tom Logan's and not Derbauer's. Anyways, let's get to the rest of the motherboard. Besides the VRM cooling, you also have a properly sized M.2 heatsink towards the bottom of the board. Thankfully, both the thermal pad and actual heatsink are substantial enough to keep an NVMe drive cool, unlike other M.2 cooling solutions that certain vendors have. Additionally, ASUS also gives you a second M.2 slot that's to the right of the DIMM slots to allow for a vertically mounted drive, which can allow for your case's airflow to help dissipate the heat from the high-powered SSD. In addition to the dual M.2 slots for SSDs, there's also eight SATA 3 ports for a bunch of drives, as well as the Intel mandated but really weird feature of the VROC connector. Say what you want about the RAID setup with VROC, requiring consumers to buy a physical key to unlock a feature of their motherboard is a pretty cash-grabby move by Intel here. 
But moving on, for the RAM setup, you have eight slots for up to 128 gigabytes of RAM capable of running up to 4,133 megahertz. Unfortunately, I don't have any RAM capable of hitting that type of frequency, but I can say that it allowed all eight of my G-Skill Trident Z RGB sticks from Rootware to run at the rated 3200 megahertz with no adjustment besides changing the DRAM frequency, which is worlds easier than it was on the previous X99 generation boards. Overclocking the Skylake X CPU was similarly just as simple. Punching in the CPU core ratio with adjusting nothing else allowed me to successfully post all the way up until a 5 GHz overclock. Obviously, allowing the BIOS to manually set the voltages while you just adjust the core ratio may skew the voltages a tad high and give you higher temperatures than you should have, but on the whole, minimal effort overclocking is definitely possible with this board. However, if you're the type that wants a bit more refinement, you can simply head on into the tweaker's paradise and fiddle to your heart's content. For fan inputs, Asus also has you covered with two sets of chassis fan pins, one set of AIO pump pins, one dedicated water pump pin set, one M.2 fan set, and two CPU fan sets with a final connector to hook up to a fan extension card, which unfortunately isn't included with the motherboard. RGB is similarly well kitted out with connection points for up to two dedicated strips and a third that can have individually addressable RGB LEDs to allow you to configure it to get the maximum frame rate out of your system. Combining my Fantex LED strip plus the Strix GPU and some RGB Trident Z RAM led to one of the best light shows I've ever seen on a PC. Asus definitely has a good thing going with their Aura LED setup here. For I.O. on the rear, you get a BIOS flashback button, two USB 2.0 ports, of which one can be allocated for the BIOS flashing, then four USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, Gigabit LAN jack, two USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports, Type A and Type C, AC Wi-Fi ports for the included magnetic antenna in the box, and finally your bank of audio ports, including optical out, powered by their Supreme FX Audio. My biggest gripe with this setup, and something I realized that Asus actually got right with the Crosshair 6 Hero, is that there's just too few USB ports. The Crosshair board has three banks of four ports, plus a few more. Only getting seven Type-A ports and one Type-C is just too few for my taste. However, they do include two USB 3.0, one USB 3.1, and one USB 2.0 connectors on the motherboard itself for a bit more of expandability. And then finally, two more issues I have with the board. For onboard buttons, there's only a power on button located next to the diagnostic LEDs. There's no reset switch or memo K button on the board, which I get that this isn't an overclocking board, so most people won't need the reset switch since their system won't be on a test bed, but come on, I use that feature almost exclusively. But that's personal grievance there. Then the second and final issue, and one that really isn't subjective, is that while the ROG Infinity window is all beautiful and gorgeous and RGB-ified, its positioning makes getting to the PCI Express latch for the GPU a proper pain in the butt. Unless you have the daintiest of fingers or use some sort of flat tool to dislodge your GPU, prepare to have your index finger compressed in order to get your card out of there. But you know what? If a lack of a reset switch and bad RGB window positioning are the largest of my complaints with this board, I'd say that's a good review, because I can find a lot to complain about with pretty much anything. I know that the VRM overheating issue will be a large concern for many of you, and rightfully so. If you're pushing your system to its breaking point, then I'd suggest waiting on ASUS and other vendors to release their later iterations of the X299 boards, especially the Rampage lineup, which is usually the ones preferred for the higher end overclocking with these high end desktop chips. But if you're just planning on doing a mild OC, want a gamer oriented board with all of the flashing lights to be both a gaming powerhouse as well as a production powerhouse, the ROG Strix X299E gaming motherboard makes a pretty compelling argument. And with that, I'm going to wrap up my review there. Let me know what you guys think of this VRM disaster issue in the comments down below. Also, what do you think about the ROG Strix motherboard? Does it have everything you would want for a high end desktop PC? Let's discuss that. Big thanks again to ASUS South Africa for sending the motherboard as well as the i7-7820X for me to check out. Be sure to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video and want to support what I do here on this channel. Also be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of my tech related content. I'm Brett with the UF Disciple channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers.